Recently, we have experienced one of the most terrible terror attack on Paris, something similar to what happened to America on September 11, with the Twin Tower being exploded by jets running into them. It is an hour where the world, I hope, I pray, I trust, will wake up to the reality of what the Islam is really all about. And that's what we're trying to do here, to educate you, for you to wake up to the reality of what the Islam religion is really all about. We have been brainwashed to think that Islam is a peaceful religion, and they, they come to us and they speak to us in two languages. To the West, they're speaking, oh, it's a peaceful religion, and among themselves, they are keen to take over the world, and we have not really woke up yet to that reality. So tolerant, I mean, so humanistic mindset that we refuse to stand up for truth and fight for truth. Even the world leaders, leaders of nations, have been so uh, paralyzed with fear of the Islam upon them that they refuse to use the word Islam is doing all of this. It is the Islam. So where are you with all of that, beloved of God? We men and women of faith, are you standing idly by? As all that you know, all that you love and cherish is being destroyed before your very eyes? Are you lending Satan a hand as his influence over the world is increasing and increasing rapidly. If you continue to live your life as you have, then this is exactly what you are doing. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon, and God only know how soon, your home will be taken from you and your life and your very soul may be in grave danger. And I want to tell you something, beloved, only you, you only can do something to stop this uh, religion, the violent religion that is determined to take the world over. But first of all, shalom from Tel Aviv in Israel, and welcome to In the Gap, where we bring you the truth from a biblical perspective about Israel and the world. Stay tuned as we separate fact from fiction and learn the truth about the danger of Islam and what you can do to stop it. But first, let's go to Sagi for an Israel update and see what is going on in Israel. Thank you, Jacob and Elisheva, and welcome to Israel Update, your source for Israeli news from a Christian perspective in under a minute. I'm Sagi Cohen, and here is today's story. In the past two months, the vicious and unprovoked attacks by Palestinians on Jewish citizens in Israel have not subsided. Last week, a three-month-old Jewish American baby was brutally murdered by a Palestinian from Jerusalem as he ran over Jewish people with his vehicle who were waiting on the train platform in central Jerusalem. All of these attacks have been perpetrated by Muslim Arabs in an attempt to drive the Jewish people out of the promised land. But we continue to hold firm to the promises of God that we will not be moved. It is written in Amos 9, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined city and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Please keep the families of those who have been affected by these tragedies in your prayers and continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel during this trying and difficult time. Back to you, Jacob and Elisheva. Welcome back, and thank you so much, Sagi, for that update. 
We often hear in the media the term Islamophobia. It is used to describe anything that opposes or criticizes Islam. The defini definition of phobia actually is having an irrational fear of something or someone. So the word phobia cannot be used in relation to Islam mm. because Islam is a religion bent on world domination and enslavement or even extermination of the non-Muslim world. Therefore, the fear of Islam is quite rational and not a phobia in any way. Over 80% of terrorist attacks in the world occur in Arab countries and countries where there is a significant Muslim population. In the last 15 years, we have seen an increase in religious-based terror attacks. And the vast majority of those attacks are performed by Muslims. Could this be a coincidence? Highly unlikely. Coincidence? Ah, that's not a coincidence, beloved of God. Islam is becoming a protected religion. Not only do they really have the freedom, we give them the freedom to really present themselves, we also protect them. It's become a protected religion. And speaking out against it, or even criticizing it, or its believers is really unacceptable. Why is this true for the Islamic religion, but not for Christianity or Judaism? Right, Christianity what? or Judaism is not protected at all anymore. You can't call it Christmas tree. You have to get on uh, crosses in schoolrooms. Judaism, they, they have to really hide. So they're not protected. Go and try to put uh, a church in the Islamic nation. Never would you be able to really do that. Churches being bent down, um, Christians being um, persecuted big time. The acceptance of the ways of the Muslims religion by the president of the United States and now also by the UN is a dangerous standard and must be fought at every turn with all our faith and conviction. So why does the Islamic religion pose such a threat to the world? What is so wrong with this so-called religion of peace as promoted by President Barack Hussein Obama and many other key liberal figures? As stated in their religion, Muslims believe that they must control the world. Once they decide that a certain area will be under Muslim control, they begin to enforce their religious rules called Sharia upon the local population. Sharia is the Islamic law which is extremely strict and every Muslim must follow it to the letter. People who drink alcohol will be harassed because it is forbidden in the Sharia law. Local women will also be harassed if they are found not to be wearing the burqa, which is the female head covering that every Muslim woman must wear. This is happening in countries throughout Europe and the Western world that are Christian-oriented and have no historical connection to the Muslim religion in any way. Recently, in some European countries, the Sharia law has been adopted in Sharia-controlled zones. These zones are any areas in the vicinity of a mosque. These mosques are multiplying throughout the city and eventually, if left unchecked, the whole city will turn into a Muslim control area. There's also now in place the Sharia police even, whose job is to look out for anyone breaking the Sharia law within the Sharia controlled zones. And we are talking about Europe here, a police inside a country. If someone is found breaking any one of these laws, they can be harassed, sometimes violently and without provocation whether the victim is Muslim or not. Beloved of God, the Quran dictates that anything non-Muslim is an affront to Islam and therefore must be destroyed. This is a reality for them. As we see in the news, Islamic immigrants to Europe and other nations do not respect authority figures or laws that are not the Islamic Sharia. Furthermore, in the eyes of the Muslims, if you are not a believer of Allah and the Quran, 
you actually have no moral justification for living. Can you imagine that? You have no right to survive if you don't believe in their Allah and their Quran. No, this is not just an extremist view. This is moderate thinking and belief for any faithful Muslim. Let's take a look at a video that will clarify things. And we always try to tell them, I always try to tell them that, look, it's not that speaker that we're inviting who has these extreme radical views, as you say. These are general views that every Muslim actually has. Every Muslim believes in these things. Everyone in the room, how many of you are normal Muslims? You're not extremist, you're not radical. This is normal Sunni Muslims. Please raise your hands. Everybody, mashallah, subhanallah. How many of you agree that the punishments described in the Quran and the Sunnah, whether it is death, whether it is stoning for adultery, whatever it is, if it is from Allah and His Messenger, that is the best punishment ever possible for humankind. And that is what we should apply in the world. Who, who agrees with that? Allahu Akbar. Are you all radical extremists? SubhanAllah. So all of you are saying that you are common Muslims. So what's, what's the politicians going to say now? What is the media going to say now? That we're all extremists? We're all radicals? We need to deport all of us from this country? SubhanAllah. Allahu Akbar. Takbir! Takbir! There is a very real reason to fear the current rapid growth of Islam throughout the world. And when I say fear, beloved of God, I am not speaking of fear as negative fear, which paralyzes, but of healthy fear, which motivate us to face evil. I mean, we need to motivates our own heart. Remember, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And we need to encourage ourselves and motivate ourselves to face evil. Islam is not a religion of peace, as we are told. And it never was. It is vital to learn about Islam and the danger this evil religion is bringing to our doorsteps. With this knowledge, we can better protect ourselves, our families, and even our very souls. We often hear Muslims saying that Islam is a religion of peace. This is the mask that they wear for the Western world, but it is in fact far from the truth. Let's look at some truth about the real nature of the Islamic faith. The meaning of the word Islam is not peace, but it is submission. Mm. And as explained in the Quran, it means complete obedience complete. to all of Muhammad's decisions. Yeah. These decisions are written in the Hadith. The Hadith tells a Muslim how to act in every area of life and so controls everything they do. When we understand this most basic and fundamental idea of Islam, we begin to realize the true danger of this religion. Bible stories are retold incorrectly in the Quran to fit the Muslim faith. For example, Islam denies that the crucifixion of Jesus ever took place and that Allah miraculously disguised someone to look like Jesus and that man was crucified. We we'll have to take a short break now and uh, we will be right back to continue discussing the truth about the Muslim's religion.
They come in to you from all over the world and they want to tell you be glad and rejoice for what we have in here in Israel. What is happening is great things with all the world coming to provoke the Jews to jealousy and we're waiting for you to come. We want to see your face here. There are 17 major crimes in Islam for which you can be punished. Some of the punishments are death, beheading, stoning and flogging. All of these punishments are most often done in public so to frighten the crowd. And according to the Islamic law called Sharia, it does not matter whether you are a Muslim believer or not. If a Muslim decides you are offending Allah, you will be punished in accordance with the Sharia law. Under Islamic law, beloved of God, a woman who claims to be raped and does not have four Muslims male witnesses is actually confessing to seductive behavior. If she happens to be married, then it is considered adultery and she will be punished. The rape of a Muslim woman is almost impossible to prove under strict Sharia law. So, if the man claims that the act was conceptual, there is very little that the woman can do to refute this because Islam places the burden of avoiding sexual encounters of any sort on the woman. However, while rape of Muslims women is against Islamic law, the rape of non-Muslims women is allowed. One of the most serious crimes in Islam is drinking alcohol. A man caught drinking alcohol will be flogged sometimes even unto death for offending Allah. In the Islamic religion, slavery is still permitted. According to the Quran and the Hadith, Muslims can and should lie and be deceitful to non-Muslims if it will promote the spreading of Islamic law. Unbelievable, eh? According to the Quran, Muslims are not allowed to integrate with non-Muslims. So the dream of the peaceful Muslim society coexisting with other major religions of the world is exactly that, a dream. The Quran commands Muslims to fight all those who don't believe in Allah. Notice, it's not defend themselves if being attacked, but simply start a fight to kill or convert. It is also written in the Quran that Christians and Jews must be subdued until they pay tribute to the Muslims. They must accept their status as second-class citizens who do not have the same equal rights as Muslims because the very notion of non-Muslim offends Islamic believers and stands in contradiction to Islamic law and the Quran. There are several truths that you must be aware of. The claim that Islam is a religion of peace is a lie. The claim that Islam is non-violent religion is a lie. Islam has only two goals, conversion or death. You say it like that in Arabic, Din Muhammad wa Din Asif. Either one is fine, which means either you really believe in the law of Muhammad or your head be cut off. And no, this is not slander. This is not a malicious generalization. This is the truth. Din al haq din al batal Din al haq what does that mean? This is the law. This is the one and only law. And any other law is considered battle, nothing, none, not important, a lie. This is Islam. So, what can we do to save ourselves? Yeah, yeah. Well, first we need to be educated, which is what we are trying to do for you now. But more importantly, we need to live out our lives in the light of our faith and put our trust in God and His promises. We need to trust that the Lord will come and eliminate the work of the evil one. 
We need to fight the war of God against the demonic religion of Islam Amen. Amen. by bringing God's love to all the people that are being blinded by the lie of Islam. And we need to understand that we love the Muslims. We want to see them saved. We feel so much compassion that they are withhold from the truth. So don't misunderstand us. We do love the Muslims. We just want, we want to warn strongly from Islam. Indeed, we love them. We love the Muslims. We just really want to stand up against the Islamic religion. Uh, and one must make the difference between the people and the religion because those people also were created in the image of God and God loved them. And so we must. And now, when we put everything in a broader context, we can see that the anti-Jewish, anti-Israeli, and anti-Zionist atmosphere in Europe and the United States in recent years is not due to some things the Jewish people have done. It is not due to some ill-mannered political action that the Israeli government has done, but it is all a part of a larger picture, a slow but constant Arabic Muslim occupation of Israel, Europe, and the US. Estimates predict that within 50, 100 years, Islam will be the major religion in Europe. And most of the inhabitants of this continent will be Muslim Arab. So I will ask you again, my beloved, are you standing idly by as your homes are being destroyed? Are you standing aside as Islam is increasing its influences over the world? Or will you stand in the gap for your home and your faith? Please join us in prayer that God would miraculously reveal himself to the Muslims and that they would turn away from the lie of Islam and accept Yeshua as the one true Messiah. And as always, for the Jewish nation in the Holy Land, the land of promise, that God promises will be fulfilled to them in our days, and there will be peace in the land. Father, we come before you with thanksgiving in our heart for such an hour, for such a time as this, and for such a time, I pray that you will move upon the saints to respond to truth. And we ask that you will really reveal yourself to many, many Muslims, Father, to wake up to the reality of what the Islam is really all about and see Yeshua, the promised one, the Prince of Peace, the one who can really conquer life with the love of God. Lord, I just pray, Father God, in your grace and your mercy, in your might and your power, that you will move not only upon the Muslims, but upon the Jews as well, any Gentile, anyone who doesn't know you, to come to see you for who you are, even to us, the saints, the believers, who hold on to the truth, who have taken this great gospel that you have really placed into our heart and presented to others. People, I pray, will really wake up to the reality of this great truth and be set free from any and every religion and come into a living relationship with you, Father, in Yeshua Mashiach and realize that life is about love. Love one another, love God. Whatsoever you do, you do unto God. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for our dear, beloved brothers and sisters. And I pray for you there, wherever you are, that the Lord will meet you with your need, whatever it might be. God knows you. He numbers your hair. And I pray that the Lord will really meet your need, where, whatever it is, and raise you up into new heights, new depth with himself, and you with yourself deep within inside. Peace, joy, love, overcoming spirit, conquering spirit, and a life that really know that truly life belongs to God. And please, don't miss next week. Yes, don't miss next week when we talk about how Israel has dealt 
with the same Islamic and Arabic issues we discussed here since the 19th century already and is standing in the gap to save the world. We have some eye-opening information for you, so be sure to tune in next week at the same time in the same place. Until then, may the Lord of Israel, the one who watches over Israel, be with you and remember to stand in the gap for the nation of Israel. Shalom, shalom. And a holy kiss? Yes. A holy kiss. You holy. No, you do that. You do that. I do that. We really love you. And true friend in this glorious calling of God on trumpet of salvation, standing in the gap for Israel. And from here, with sincere, earnest prayer and love, may God continue to unite us to his glory, to his honor, and to the advancing of his kingdom. And a holy kiss, as always. Yes. We had an idea that together we can change the nation of Israel. We realize that everyone can't afford to come to Israel to share the gospel with the Jewish people, but we believe that together we can send one person. We can send five or ten people, and we can accomplish great things. The Bible says in Romans, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? We want you to send people to preach the gospel. We're asking you to donate whatever you can. $25, $100, $500, whatever you can give makes a difference in Israel. You do the sending, then that person does the preaching. Israelis hear, they believe, and they're saved. When 120 of you donate $25, you send someone here to Israel to preach the gospel. When 30 of you come together and give $100 each, you send someone to Israel to preach the gospel. It's that simple. Working together, you send out people from all over the world to come back to Israel and share the gospel with the Jewish people. We're asking you, can the nation of Israel be saved? Our God is a great God who does great and marvelous things. We believe he wants to lead the people of Israel back to him, and he wants to use you to do it. We know all this seems like such an impossible task to accomplish by yourself. That's why we're asking you, part of the body of Christ, to unite with brothers and sisters so that together we can turn the nation of Israel back to God.